Excellency, Honorable Guest Speaker and Globes, Ladies and Gentlemen, here come to the end of our last session and we moving to plenary session for the panel discussion. For the panel discussion, we actually have link of Google form drop in the chat box to kindly go to the chat box and fill the information for the project. Our technical team is dropping the links in the chat box. If you can, if you have any questions, yes, you can actually drop the question in the chat box. Without further delay, I would like to invite our panel discussion moderator, Professor Bubbly J. L. B. Texas A. M. University. And the panel discussion is about leadership and mentoring. How can school leaders mentor and coach their teachers? So I would like to give the floor to Professor Bubbly J. L. B. Panel discussion moderator. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to share information about leadership and mentoring uh, in schools. And with me today, I believe that uh, we have uh, three panelists uh, with us today, and I'm going to ask them each to share a bit about themselves. Uh, Dr. Um, Christine, yes, there she is. Okay. So um, <clears throat> these are our three panelists and um, they're very esteemed uh, professors and uh, have, they, they themselves have actually done a lot of mentoring and coaching in their time. And uh, they are going to share with you today, Dr. Alan Chong, who is also on the list. Uh, something came up at his university at the um, Hong Kong in Hong Kong, and he could not attend uh, today. So um, he sends his regrets, but wishes us all well. So um, the first thing that I would like to um, ask our panelists to do is just to introduce themselves, and then I will introduce myself last. So we will start with Dr. Nilsa Thoros. Thoros sorry. So greetings, everybody. My name is Nelsa Thorses. I'm a professor at the National University here in California, USA. And uh, I, I'm very excited and honored to be here because this is one of my favorite topics, mentoring. So thank you for having me. Now, thank you. Dr. Christine Naga, would you please uh, introduce yourself? Greetings, everyone. My name is Christine Nganga. I am at the George Washington University in the US uh, at DC, and I'm really excited to be with you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christine. Dr. Lara? Thank you, Dr. Erby. Uh, greetings. Good morning. Good evening. Uh, greetings for Texas A&M University, Texas. It is a great pleasure to be here to share our experiences, successes in this critical component that day by day get more and more attention more for the impact that little by little we are understanding is behind. And we are here to, to share our experiences. And I hope that at the end of this session, you will leave thinking, reflecting about this beautiful construct that we call mentorship. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Beverly Irby and I'm, um, Regents Professor and um, Senior Associate Dean in the College of Education and Human Development in the College of Education um, and uh, in, at Texas A&M University. And um, I'm so uh, honored to be a part of the uh, Cambodian um, Conference on Mentoring and Coaching. 
And uh, it's been a, a great experience and just learning from everyone who's been on. I, I told Dr. Thorsis that I was in a session with one of her colleagues from National University last night, and uh, it was a very excellent session. So uh, we hope everyone has been enjoying the sessions um, during this time. So <clears throat> we are going to be uh, talking, uh, and we were invited by uh, His Excellency, uh, Professor Chan Roth, uh, who is the director there at the National, uh, I mean, at the New Generation um, Research, Pedagogical Research Center there in at the National Institute of Education. And we um, are so honored to have been invited to be here. We're going to talk about mentoring uh, in, in leadership and uh, leaders mentoring their teachers and how they can uh, do that. Uh, we think that it's very critical. Um, now we have found that it is the leaders uh, in the schools that really make uh, the difference. It is like this, um, as the leader is, so goes the school. So we must have great leaders on our campuses and we must have um, great leaders at the district level. And I know that you have uh, excellent leaders in Cambodia at the national level. We uh, met with the, His Excellency, uh, the Minister of Education, Naron, yesterday. And um, I know that he is a, an excellent leader and is making a lot of great strides there in Cambodia. So, <clears throat> We will be talking about leadership and mentoring and coaching. Now, I wanna say one thing before we get started, and I have some questions for our panelists, but um, in our uh, Wiley Blackwell International uh, Handbook on Mentoring, um, I really posed the issue that mentoring is actually becoming or is an emerging discipline. Um, I believe that it is. Um, and that is because it fits uh, the definition now of a discipline. We have um, organizations that are uh, really uh, based on mentoring. Um, we have programs about mentoring. We have at the NGPRC, we even have in Cambodia a master's degree in mentoring education. We also have um, the, um, we have journals that are devoted to mentoring and coaching and tutoring. And uh, so all of those things, when you have that, you are really moving toward uh, becoming a discipline and an area of study. And we have many, many um, papers that are being written about mentoring. Um, I've served as the, uh, I'm now uh, editor emerita for the Mentoring and uh, Tutoring Partnership and Learning Journal for Rutledge Taylor Francis. And um, served, have, I've served that um, journal for the past 11 years. So um, I believe we are there. So that is a great feat for the area of mentoring. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about before I ask the questions, the second thing, I guess, is that, uh, you know, what is mentoring and what is coaching? So they're just a little bit different. And, uh, you know, mentoring, um, I define as an ongoing process uh, that involves a relationship between a, maybe a less experienced, we'll talk about leaders, maybe a less experienced leader and a more experienced leader. So, or the same with a, a teacher or, or teachers if they're doing some peer me mentoring. And um, perhaps they're working on a, a skill that should be attained long-term, but that relationship and developmental relationship is very important in mentoring. And then the coaching process uh, shares some similarities with mentoring, but it's more structured, um, it's time delimited, and it's centered on a specific skill or a skill set 
more so than mentoring. It might be time delimited. We might work on a specific thing in coaching, a specific item or skill, and then we move on. But during that coaching process, one could potentially become a mentor and develop that long-term relationship. So my first question um, that I have for uh, the panel is, um, let me find my questions. What happened to my questions? Sorry. Misplaced my question. Here it is. It's under another piece of paper. Um, so, panelists, would you just share um, what do you understand to be two of the most critical components of school leaders' actions? as they mentor or coach their teachers. So we'll start with you, Dr. Thorsos. Thank you. So in my experience and my journey, uh, I, my past life before I, was a, I became a professor, I was a supervisor at the school district. And uh, that was my first <laughs> encounter with this concept of coaching and mentoring, because you wear many hats uh, at the, in, in California in the school district. And I was charged with a special education program. And um, based on the data that was guiding me, uh, there were some actions. And one of them was to really look at how is it that we're providing support to the teachers in the programs to increase success. So my, with my experience with mentoring, it was relational because that they had to really not see me as their supervisor or the, in a role of coaching or evaluator, but to really see that we were sharing a vision, a mission, a goal, and we were all pulling the rope the same way. And that took time that, that you do not just put in a, an Alka-Seltzer and water and there it is, a relationship. It is, uh, mentoring is relational and you have to develop that trust. You have to walk the talk. They have to really see that uh, you're part of that solution. And most importantly, it shouldn't be top to bottom. It should be everybody at the table in that space, having a, con a conversation in which we develop the plan together. And it took uh, two or three years to really start seeing the results, the success stories in that space. Fast forward, uh, as, a, as a professor at the university, I'm a product of a mentorship. Uh, I had a wonderful mentor uh, when I went to my doctoral program and uh, I continue my relationship with my mentors till today, it's a lifelong relationship. So as a professor in a doctoral program, you start uh, the, developing that mentoring of your candidates for the doctoral program. And it's also a lifelong relationship in, to, in which you continue to do all these things together and learn from each other. So one thing is a relationship. The other thing, uh, the other component is very important is to understand that you are also benefiting and learning from each other. You're a lifelong learner. So it's about that self-check, constantly checking myself. The, 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 if I uh, have a doctoral degree, a terminal degree, it does not mean that I know everything. I'm constantly learning. And one of the, the biggest successes of recently were lessons learned from the COVID-19 and the closures and how we had to really uh, build a plane as we were flying it. And I learned more from my uh, colleagues, from principals in the school sites, what they were doing, success stories, and they would learn from us, but it's a relational thing. So relational and... Uh, most important when learning from each other, that trust that you are also a learner. How beautiful. 
Yes. Uh, Dr. Christine, would you like to share now? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Abby and Dr. Thosos for getting us started. I would say that one of the most critical actions for a good mentor is good modeling. Sometimes, especially if we are in traditional settings, like where I come from, my home country is Kenya, there are times when you may find that principals just want to be behind doors and ask people to do certain things. But you realize that a good mentor is the one who actually models what the expectations are and is able to be visible in the hallways, guiding new teachers, helping them understand the school culture, allowing them to see, not just to hear what you expect them to do, but also allowing them to see what those expectations look like. When we think about especially new teachers, and we know that new teachers often leave the profession within the first five years, part of that is because they feel very isolated and they feel like they are not part of the school community. So one of the most critical actions for a good school leader and a good mentor is to help those new teachers really become part of the school and also model those expectations of that particular school. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well said. These are all things as we're thinking about leadership in the school and critical components of school leaders and what our school leaders need to be doing for uh, our teachers in mentoring. Uh, Dr. Laura Alessio, would you please uh, share? Thank you, sure. Um, in addition to what uh, my colleagues have shared, relational trust, modeling, I believe that also there, there is a quite great space for the way that we mentor teacher thinking about ourselves, who we are, what our philosophy of education is, what about the philosophy of leadership is, in what capacity, based on the time that we are living, we would like to provide the new generation with better tools like every single student has the chance to succeed in schools. Doesn't matter if they are rural, they are urban, they are in remote areas, thinking all the great benefits that we can utilize through the great power of education. But we need to know ourselves first in order to be able to move forward. That's why, again, extremely critical to think about philosophy of education, philosophy of leadership, philosophy of our teachers. How can we provide better professional development, better economic opportunities to make our profession bear to what already is, I think that we can do. And we have to think about those important uh, forces. Philosophy is extremely critical because if we don't have philosophy, it's like, like to get a boat in the middle of the ocean and we don't know where to go. So if we have a clear line, our philosophy of education, like I said at the beginning, the opportunity to provide to the new generation bear tools, I think it's a good way to go, regardless where they are. Here in Texas, for those who know Texas, Texas is a huge state. It's the largest state in the nation with many, 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 many rural schools, in the more remote areas. And years ago, when we had the opportunity to secure some good federal grant, we were able to figure out the best way by using high technology, 
including virtual mentors that we're going to talk later. The opportunities to be sure that regardless where those teachers were, we were able to send the spirit of education. And this is something like years went by and still we had those communities doing different, doing well. So it's extremely important to think about ourselves, where we are, where we want to go, our mission, our vision. And I think that this is one of the most critical components. And the other one is a kind of reflection, constantly reflecting about our own practices. My colleagues uh, mentioned their mentor, yes. I had my mentor at the university level. I had mentors in other levels. And we, first generation, meaning our parents never ever had the opportunity to attain higher education. But thanks to the power of our mentor, we were able to find little by little better ways. And thanks to them, we are where we are. So as you can see, like Dr. Ervis says, it's becoming a discipline. It's more than a discipline. Involves many great things, yeah. uh, philosophy, yeah. way, way a different way of thinking, acting. And I'm so glad that uh, you will have your master program in this beautiful area, because I'm absolutely sure that the quality of education already is there. Thank you, Dr. Laura. So <clears throat> my next question, and by the way, we will uh, have some time for the participants to ask some questions too. So please be sure you put those, your questions in the chat. Our next question to the panelists is, um, what are some innovative ways that you have um, experienced or, or you have seen or understood from the research even that leaders can engage in mentoring and coaching their teachers. So what are some innovations or innovative ways that you have observed or read about in the research about coaching, engaging in mentoring and coaching their teachers? We'll just, I guess, go back around. <laughs> All righty. Uh this is a very exciting time that we're living through, even though it's a, from a horrible tragedy, this COVID-19. But what it did, the phenomena, what it did was it forced us as human beings <laughs> around the globe to get out of our comfort zone. We were doing uh, perpetually uh, our practice being perpetuated constantly because it was our comfort zone. Actually, we had some myth that oh, we can't do this. We can't coach teachers in the classroom to do student teaching unless we're there in person or unless the teacher is in there in person, we can't fulfill that requirement. We need to do it hands-on, boots on the ground. And because of COVID, there were some lessons learned then some of the lessons that were learned was that it is possible to fulfill certain uh, activities out of that, you know, uh, traditional practices. So uh, what we've learned, as my team has learned, two essential things: uh, always, always, always networking, communicating being part of a community of learners and educators and finding out what are other members of the tribe, you know, the so-called tribe are doing to be successful. And that communication, that interaction informed us as well as we share with others, what does research tell us? What does this mean in theory and having the opportunity to access that in practice. That is one of the most important functions that I see myself as a professor is that communicating, having a, being an active member, a participant 
of the community with other schools, schools where it's happening, uh, it, it's not really effective if you're a leader. And like uh, Dr. Nanya said, uh, they're behind closed doors. You know, that, that um, what do you call that, the silo. We're no longer uh, surviving like that. We can't, we have to break down those silos and really start networking. We also found out that uh, one of the biggest lessons that I learned was to get over my fear and start uh, implementing technology. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there that, yeah, that's fine. I'm very happy that some um, principals are using it. Uh, some teachers are using it, the novice teachers, because they're, you know, digital natives. But when it comes to, there's also that generational factor that some of us that are uh, digital immigrants, uh, there's fear, you know, because there's a, there's a big fear under, uh, underpinning there. So getting over that and trusting others to lead you, to allow you to learn, create space like that, that it's uh, trust, that you could trust each other and learn from each other. So there are a lot of technology tools out there that you can grapple with, find a partner, and you can co-mentor. That word co-mentoring, Dr. Irby, should be part of that discipline. The idea that we, uh, it's not a power issue uh, mostly in education when uh, you're dealing with uh, faculty members in the university and IHE, uh, you, uh, Institute of Higher Education, and you're partnering with school systems. It is not that I know more or you know more, it's we create a space of trust and we learn from each other. Technology, uh, and there's a saying in my group is atrévete, dare, dare to try new things in technology. If it's not gonna break and it's not gonna break you, and there are excellent tools out there that you can remotely uh, support and mentor others without leaving your, your own you know, physical environment. The other one is networking, creating these relationships where you're an active participant in that community. Absolutely. Um, and I, we'll go to Dr. Uh, Christine next. As Dr. Thosos was talking, I was the word that came to mind is going beyond the instrumental and the mechanistic way of thinking about mentoring. Because as we continue to think about the needs of children in K-12 schools or in any of our educational institutions, we have to go beyond. We have to think of uh, innovative ways of developing talent of our teachers. So for school leaders who think that it's checking a box, that is not gonna work anymore. We have to think of ways that we can continue to inspire our teachers and continue to develop that great talent so that our teachers feel supported and they feel inspired to continue to do this work. There's a lot of burnout that our teachers are experiencing and we must find a way to continue to support them both, not just cognitively, but socially, emotionally, so that they are able to do this work. So when we think of how um, mentoring is, you know, giving feedback to something that a teacher has done, but what do, how do we provide those other social, emotional support systems so that they can continue to do really great work in, time, in times like this that are very challenging? Thank you so much. That is so true about uh, leaders on the campuses. They really need to uh, consider that social, emotional uh, situation that um, our teachers certainly have been in and continue um, every day in those classrooms. So thank you very much for reminding us of that as well. Uh, Dr. Lara, what are some innovative um, ways? Me, yeah, let me try to respond your question by sharing a kind of innovation 
that we have uh, put it on practice here in Texas. But before that, uh, we I always said when I had the opportunity to talk in different, in different and for different audiences, how blessed we have been by getting quite good external sources from the federal government that allow us to be updated in technology, updated in instructional materials, etc. And with those resources, like I said at the beginning, we have been able to reach any remote area, exactly the quality of technology that we have right now, appear that we are a couple feet from where you are, and we are thousands of thousands of miles. Let's put it something like this is what we have in Texas. So anyway, um, it's this kind of innovation is what we call the preparation of the instructional skills specialist in the different areas, in content areas, no content areas, parental involvement, all the different components that makes the organization of a school. So we provide training for pedagogical reasons. We provide training for content reasons. Uh, we have, in some cases, the opportunity upon request to spend a good deal of time observing schools who, for some reason, they level um, so I kind of turn around the schools, the schools who are now achieving at, at the level expected. So we train our instructional skills with unique tools, uh, for sure, using high mentoring and coaching techniques. Someone was asking the difference, and we can provide examples along the conversation. And through this kind of input, we have been able to observe the power once those instructional skills specialists are able to do in the classroom or outside the classroom, uh, working with parents, working with peers, etc. So this kind of in innovation, like I said, is a, for us a great way to respond uh, about the role of mentor. We mentor the skill specialists in the way that they're supposed to understand their practices that improve quality instruction. And that's the way that um, I believe is one of those kind of innovations that uh, we can continue and we would like to continue disseminating across different schools regardless of where they are. Thank you so much, Dr. Laura. I, I will add that for that particular one, because we work together uh, on this, um, this team of skill specialists uh, in a school, um, they gather around um, a computer like we are. And so they're observing the teacher in the classroom and they are having a, the skill specialist who is, they are an extension of the principal. So they are able to share or to, they're the, the eyes and the ears because a principal cannot get into a cl every classroom every day. But these skill specialists can go out and they can be in a classroom. They can help the teachers, they can coach the teachers. But how do they do that and how do they calibrate? So what we do is we use technology and they are sitting around the computer together or the screen together watching the teacher. So they have these pedagogical items that they decide have decided upon that they're going to watch, look for, and they can have these discussions and as the, as the class is going on, and they discuss this among themselves and calibrate uh, these observations that they are having. And so when um, each is assisting or coaching uh, the teacher then in the classroom, then they're giving the, the same messages across this campus. It helps to improve the instruction because we're talking now the same language and um, they, about pedagogy at a, at a really foundational level. And so uh, this is 
another thing about those skills specialists, um, we consider them as part of the leadership team as well. So they are leaders as well on their campus. Um, they're teachers, of course, who are very, very skilled in their, their own teaching in their own right, but they are part of the leadership. So thank you. Um, so my next question is uh, for the team is uh, and for the panel, what types of school teacher mentoring programs have you witnessed? And uh, what was the most effective part of the program? In other words, what made that program successful? Do you want me to go first? <laughs> All righty. Well, this is gonna reveal how old I am, but uh, I've been <laughs> I've been an educator for many, many years. Uh, and at the beginning, uh, one of the things that I was charged with was to assign my teacher candidates to go to the schools to do their student teaching. So one of those things is that we have a memorandum of understanding. And the idea is <laughs> that the school is in partnership with the university with a teaching uh, credential program. And uh, we, uh, the expectation is that they're gonna select the best, the most senior, the most experienced, wonderful teacher model to be the mentor, the teacher's uh, supervisor and the mentor of this teacher candidate during their clinical practice. Fast forward in the real world, that's not, what happens, uh, institutional practices, typically what was going on with my relationship with my schools was that the principal would assign somebody, you're it. It was somebody's turn to serve as a, a the classroom teacher um, um, mentor and it wasn't working uh, because their heart wasn't in it. They perceived it as a punishment and uh, or another load workload that they had to do, even though there might be some uh, monetary benefit to it, but it wasn't something that it was in their heart. It wasn't a calling. So what I learned from that and one of the <laughs> strategies that I started was to flip it, to start talking about uh, leadership servant. What is a servant? What's a leadership? How do we pay it forward? I started developing relationship with the schools, with the teachers, uh, those teachers in the field that there were subject matter experts and talking about what would be your legacy when you leave this profession? What would be some a mark that you leave behind? And I talked about my own experience and one of my most uh, cherished experiences that I have teachers right now in the field that I mentored that I supervised. And so I felt that, that that calling to pay it forward. So how do you replicate that? Well, again, relationship, conversations, uh, modeling, and uh, through the principal, talking to the principals, how can we flip it? Instead of uh, you're it, how about it's a reward and recognition. You're such an excellent teacher, outstanding teacher. And you, it's an honor for you to be the, the mentor teacher. So it took a while. Again, none of these things are the Alka-Seltzer that you put in water and it's, there it is. It takes a little while to develop this uh, idea, but it happened eventually and it uh, shifted the, the practices. So it's that idea of the communication between one institution and the other and talking about it, but it has to be everybody at the table talking about it, brainstorming, and the idea fermented from that, from that brainstorm, from that conversation with the principals, with the people in charge to help us ensure that the best quality model teacher was the one providing the support for our, our novice teachers. So that's one um, thing that we learned from that. The other is looking at evidence-based uh, practices. And that's available for anybody around the world, just looking at the research, looking at what are, what's the data telling us 
bringing that information to the school site. I'm talking from wearing that at and uh, having opportunities of uh, sharing those insights and to see if they want to try it. If they're curious enough, they're hungry for that change. And I've had success with that. Uh, but it's important, again, it's that idea that I'm not coming into your space to tell you, well, this is the way to do it. I don't want you assigning teachers. You know, our mutual uh, memorandum of understanding was that you're giving us the best of the best. And it turns out we had to flip it also with that conversation saying, how about if we turn this into a, 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 an idea that it's evidence of success. This teacher is so successful that she's granted this honor. <laughs> and, uh, and that took a while to change the culture, but because the culture is a culture, and otherwise, you know, then you're an agent, you're not an agent of change, you're just perpetuating certain practices that are not productive. The last thing I have to say that, uh, that I, I didn't want to sound um, um, snobby, but there, it's very important that when we have these relationships, like Dr. Lara was talking about, is the self-check in terms of power. There's always a dynamic of power, uh, engagement, and the perception of who has power over whom in, uh, in these spaces, especially in school settings, is very the hierarchy. We have the, you know, the king, the superintendent, then it goes all the way to the school site principal and their relationship with the universities or teacher credential programs. So it's very important to really keep in mind what is uh how what are the terms of engagement in terms of creating that safe space that everybody feels comfortable uh, uh, so, uh, volunteering ideas and honoring each other's um, uh, presence in that in that circle it's just it's very important to create that idea that it's not a hierarchy that we're there because we have something to to give and to provide, to be part of a solution. So that's an important point. Thank you for those three major points. That's very, very good. Um, Dr. Nanga? One of the things we've been thinking about in my university is the pipeline. So when we think of new teachers, um, master teachers, teacher leaders, and then aspiring school principals, and then the principalship, and what that pipeline can look like. So for us, with the master teachers and aspiring school principals, they have a bit more agency than new teachers. So one of the things we ask them to be thinking about is what, what are my leadership gaps and what kind of skill sets do I want to learn from my mentor? So that we put the honors on them to really choose a mentor in their school district wisely, because that mentor is supposed to help them get the very skill sets they feel that they need. Because when you're developing the teacher leaders, master teachers into the next level of school leadership, they don't all need the same thing. Some of them are working towards uh, the instructional side of things. Others are more interested in um, the, the, the curriculum, the assessment. So each of them has a certain area of skill that they feel is a leadership gap. So when, when I think of a good mentoring program and, and the success of it is helping those middle level, what I call middle level master teachers, teacher leaders have the agency and think about where do I want to go next and who is that mentor who can facilitate that. And so our role as the university is to continue to make sure that those communication channels are really uh, are good and vibrant so that we can support the communication, we can support the learning, 
we can support um, any kind of evaluation tools they may require and allow that next um, generation of school leaders to come up from the master teacher, uh, teacher leadership pool. So I would say a great <laughs> mentoring program is one that also thinks about the next generation of leaders. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I really like that pipeline idea. And um, I think that I know that in, um, in Cambodia and then in the, in the uh, NGPRC and in the new, uh, new generation schools, um, they are working on placing out mentors into the schools. And um, I think that this is a, this is a type of pipeline uh, program and training um, those teachers in the in that uh, mentoring education uh, master's degree. So I think that that they're doing a great job and have have a good um, a good concept going there. I think it would, would be interesting to do some of those types of things um, in the U.S. as well. So anyway, it gives us some great ideas. <laughs> um, Dr. Lara. Yes, thank you, Dr. Erby. Um, let me share uh, two types of uh, experiences uh, using mentoring and coaching. Both are based in, like I said at the beginning, in two funded federal programs. Uh, one is a project that we the acronym is E-T-E-L-L, -E -L, ETL, that stands for Empowering Teacher of English Language Learners. So our commitment is to prepare teachers who are working with kids who come to a school with another language than English. And you can see the challenge, the truly challenge, when we receive kids coming most kids coming from Central America, Latin America, having Spanish as the only native language. And the challenge that teachers have is to be sure that those kids in a very short period of time can develop the proper English academic language to be successful in classroom and then in society. So part of our work is to provide the best that we can, effective professional development practices for teachers, because in addition that they have to do better in schools, they also have to have the state language exam. Without exam, they cannot be in neither bilingual or ESL classroom, they have to pass. So we prepare all the curriculum, via virtual, via involving virtual mentoring, virtual coaching, virtual classroom observation. And we provide the training for eight, 12, 15 weeks, depending, bilingual is more complicated than ESL, to be sure that they are grasping the different uh, contents. So in addition to have a better understanding of what's going on in a school, still can have the opportunity to pass, like I said, the Texas language examination exam. So we provide the training with my students who most of them were in some time in service teachers. Today, they are working for the doctoral degrees and we collect data. And the great thing is that uh, we split the group in what we call A, experimental group, and B, no experimental group or control group. The experimental group will the group that receive the full package of virtual mentoring and coaching. And the control group receive only the different modules to understand all the different components of the linguistic, uh, morphology, syntaxis, et cetera. Uh, and to be also able to, to, to take the test. When we receive the result from the state of Texas, 
our big surprise that the both groups did well, did well, meaning all the control and experimental passed the Texas language exam. But then the question was, who did better? And then we returned back to the data and we found out statistically speaking that the group of kids, uh, uh, sorry, the group of teachers who were under what we call teachers under mentoring and coaching, they received the highest scores in the language uh, provided by the state of Texas. Uh, then they were convinced that the concept of mentoring and coaching work well. Yeah. Here's the evidence, okay? And the same thing we did it with another uh, federal grant called LISTO, LISTO, L-I-S-T-O. This it's, it's an Spanish acronym, but it stands for Literacy in Field Science, Technology, and Other Opportunities. Uh, we were working at the middle school level and still uh, working today with teachers and providing feedback wherever they are. And it's quite interesting the way that we provide the feedback because we provide the feedback in real time, feedback with a bug in the ears. Sometimes kids thinking that the teacher is crazy because she's talking along. No, we are providing the, <laughs> the mentoring in that way. But this is another effective way that teachers feel like we are providing the correct input at the time, the same time they, that they are teaching different subjects. So this is another a nice way that we can express the power of mentoring and coaching, not to mention virtual, because through virtual, we can reach any point in the world. So this is those kind of a really experiences that I enjoy it and continue sharing anytime that I had the opportunity, the power of mentoring, the power of coaching and the power of virtual uh, classroom, the, the, uh, virtual mentoring, virtual uh, uh, coaching, etc. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> we've also been doing some work with uh, virtual uh, professional development and mentoring, virtual mentoring and coaching in China um, as well. So that's true around the world. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to have time to. Um, for, for people to ask questions or to answer some of the questions that are in the chat, uh, panelists. Um, I, I would like to just for you, if you could briefly answer this question because this is very important to us. Um, and that is about just how we can make mentoring and coaching accessible to all teachers everywhere. How can we do that? How can leaders do that? So if you would just briefly answer that question and we'll get to our questions uh, with uh, Mr. Natra Ron. He is going to ask the questions for us. Thank you. Perfect. I'll be brief. So uh, in order to do that, to have access to mentors for all teachers, it would have to be a shift of culture. It would, it's, it's, a, it's a vision, it's a decision, it's a goal, it has to be shared, but it has to shift that culture. And it's from the leadership, having the vision, having that goal that I've, I've, in order for me to create the space that uh, th th it'll be a successful environment. My goal is to have access to mentors for all my teachers. That's, it starts from there. And then the shift of the culture. The other one is just uh, networking successful people, inviting them. Have a, a dare to do that. Open your doors. Create that community. You create it. There's no book or no a button to push. Most importantly is to make the decision, create your goals, your vision, create the culture, build it, and they will come. I've seen it happen. Thank you, Dr. Thorsos. Dr. Nanga? I will share one. If it's part of your vision, let the resources follow. 
and resources may not always be monetary, although monetary resources are required, but resources may be in terms of time. Are you giving your master teachers time to also be able to be good mentors or are you overloading them so that they cannot have the time to be good mentors? So my one key thing is resources, not just monetary, but also time. Excellent point. Dr. Laura? I would say, I'm taking some word from Dr. Torsos. Uh, I would say sharing successful real stories, um, creating a cultural success, and always, regardless who the person is, to be able to extend a hand. Don't wait that they are coming to you. You have to go to them. Because we already know the benefits. Then the process, creating levels of trust. So we have, in, most, in many cases, to extend our hand. And then little by little, they're understanding the benefits. It's not easy, it takes time. But I believe that that could be for, for me what sharing uh, also a word that my colleagues had said before, uh, sharing successful stories is real powerful, very, very powerful. Thank you so much. And I, I think that, you know, to, to make this accessible uh, to all teachers, um, it's really about the leader uh, creating the climate uh, on that campus uh, to make uh, mentoring and coaching an integral, integral part of the organization. And uh, we have to be equitable with all teachers and uh, think about um, the different levels of teachers. We have different career phases. Uh, we just did a, um, a systematic review over, uh, over 1,000 papers that we reviewed. And there are uh, various career stages and phases of teachers. And we know that you know, they're, the novice teachers need a lot of help. What about those who are in the late teaching, their late teaching uh, stages or phases? Um, and what can they do to help mentor the younger teachers? So um, we have to think about that, but it is the leader who sets the tone and who sets the vision. Um, we will now um, turn it over to um, Mr. Netrarun, who will uh, ask, I believe you're going to be asking us some other questions from the audience. Thank you. I think you're muted. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry. So thank you very much, Dr. Elby, for your great moderating the panel discussion. And thank you very much, yes, Dr. Sosos, Dr. Christine, and Dr. Laura for your great sharing with us about leadership and mentoring. Actually, we have um, many questions in the chat box waiting for you to answer. So allow me to uh, read the question for you. Um, the first question is from um, Mr. Lee Dawood. And the question is that, um, how do you encourage lecturers who involve more focus on mathematics or IT in their field, if they are in the field of social science? In this kind of question is mean that um, the, the teacher or lecturer, they are expertise in social science. So um, how, how could we do in order to encourage the teacher or lecturer to you know, have more focus on mathematics or IT? So, so that's a question. And I would, I would give it the floor to um, Dr. Abhi. So that's related to, um, to um, mentoring? Yes, uh -huh. to mentoring. So in this uh -huh. case, this, this means that um, I mean, the, the teachers is expertise in social science, so they have less experience in terms of mathematical IT. So working as a mentor, how yeah. can we do in order to encourage the teacher to learn more about like mathematics or IT, Thank something you. like that? So this is mentoring in, in a content field, a different content field from their own area of expertise, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yes. Who would like to take that question? 
which of our panelists? Okay, Dr. Thorsis. Yes, it's uh, it's part of mentoring, but it's also to encourage and to uh, allow that uh, lecturer to really visit others that are implementing IT, that are using uh, mathematics in their field. So somebody that they can shadow will be helpful in terms of that. But uh, I don't see that really as a mentoring issue. I really see that more as a, a coaching and management for that lecturer to really meet the requirements of that job. But one way to do it in a soft way would be to have the lecturer shadow somebody to see you know, what is expected and, uh, and, and, and provide the resources and support to do that, to be successful, because it's gonna be a learning curve. Uh, can I say something? <laughs> sure, of course. Um, one day I was in my, in my office and a, a, a mathematician came to my office. He is uh, from Germany. And he, uh, and he says, Rafael, I don't understand how kids, students from Central America, Mexico, no, they no longer have this love for mathematics. Oh, they say, how boring is this topic? Uh, abstract concepts. Can you help me to? Well, I said to myself, I talking to colleagues from other countries. And when we are teaching mathematics, most of the time, we don't consider the culture where the content is embedded. What do you mean by that? Well, I said, it's something like we call today ethno, ethno mathematics. How the Mayan did mathematics. And this is the way that has, it's what I was talking about at the beginning, how critical it is to think about our philosophy in the process, mentoring, mentoring teachers, mentoring the new generations to have this love because if something has, if something is beautiful in mathematics, is that this beautiful branch open opportunities to everyone what we are doing in our research is at the kindergarten level, introducing mathematical concepts. So those kids, when they're growing, oh, I don't understand that this algebra is only symbols. Yes, mathematics is a symbolic language, but when we provide things in a meaningful way, we enjoy. So here again, mentoring the new generation of teachers to think different. That is one of the challenges that we have and is today missing. Again, we develop and we have a couple of, a couple of papers addressing the role of ethnomathematics, ethnoscience, because when we are missing the culture, I believe that we are missing the flavor of the content. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Ermi no longer is there. Would you like another oh, yeah. question? Would you like to ask another question? Um, Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Kristen, do you have do you want to add something more? Thank you very much. No, let's, let's have time for another question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, here come another question from uh, Mr. Ian Chitra about coaching and mentoring. Actually, um, at the first and at the beginning of the panel discussion, um, our panelists also. Uh, mentioned about like uh, coaching and mentoring. So could you please mention a little bit more with um, actual example, the differences between uh, coaching and mentoring? So um, I, I would hand a question to um, Dr. Kristen. Yes, I think Dr. Abby had introduced the session with um, letting us know a bit of the difference between mentoring and coaching. And I'll just add a little bit of that. I think 
coaching has an element of performance and a skill set, a, a specific skill set that you would like someone to know and be able to do. And mentoring has also a kind of a social, um, a social support attached to it. So that's the way I differentiate mentoring and coaching. Coaching is very skill-based. Mentoring has other components attached to them. And also, um, coaching is also very developmental. We, 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 we want our teachers to understand to do this. And then the next time we want them, we give them a feedback loop, we revisit the feedback, and then we look at the next skill that they are working on. And then there's another feedback loop. So I would see coaching again, more as developmental. And even if mentoring is developmental, it doesn't have the kind of uh, boundaries around evaluation and um, skill building like coaching does. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that, you know, the breaking down of skills is really important. And um, in coaching, you think about, um, you know, the, uh, like, think about a tennis coach, you know, and a tennis coach might help someone to uh, learn the backhand stroke. And um, so, you know, they, they learn all the nuances of that, and they might break that little stroke down into smaller skills and start uh, starting the technique of, um, you know, with the, with the learner and where that learner is. And just um, thinking about uh, looking at the learner, observing the learner and of the of the tennis uh, stroke and looking at even weaknesses in order to really overcome, help that person overcome the weaknesses and to develop the weaknesses into strengths. And so I think, you know, they would look at the foot placement. If you're, if you're a tennis player, you know, you look at your feet and how they're placed, where they are. And then he would, uh, he or she would talk to the person about that and work on that, work on the hand position on the racket when you're, when you're playing tennis, you know, where, where's your hand on the racket and where are your shoulders? Are you squaring your shoulders off? So they, they work on all of that. And that becomes a really powerful tool uh, to help the learner in tennis to do better. And so that's just an example of things that we know in terms of tennis and coaching, that would not be uh, mentoring. So mentoring, as uh, Dr. Christine said, that is um, uh, more of the relationship building um, and um, working with dyads, working with reflective dialogues, where we're talking about um, working through a, a, a deeper level of conversation and, um, and reflection. Netra, we could go on to another question, maybe. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Abhi and Dr. Christine, for your wonderful answers. Thank you so much. So um, here come another questions. Um, Dr. Lara, you want to add something? Me? Yes, do you want to add something? Yes, I because really I like it. Uh, yes. I really like uh, when Dr. Ervi underlined one of the characteristics of mentoring. Uh, I would say deep, when Dr. Torso was talking about uh, her mentor, mentors, the same, the same memory came to my mind with my mentoring. Always we spend long conversation and always living, thinking and thinking, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. Uh, for the first time, I heard from my mentor the word legacy. Someday, Rafael, you have the opportunity to be in academia here in the United States. Think about how critical it is when you are leaving, when you are retiring. At that time, it's 30 something years old. I wish we talking about retirement, but I said, think about your legacy. And then, thinking about the opportunity to mentor our students by providing better opportunities 
better facilities, better way to conduct research, to disseminate research in conferences across the world, to be sure the knowledge and the result of the knowledge go to everyone. And that is one of the power, I would say personally, under mentoring. This great opportunity to reflect about the multiple opportunities that we have, not just only to understand, but also to transform the world, which is extremely critical to put it in the new generation. So I think that mentoring can help us to move in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great answer, Dr. Lara. So um, actually for the rest of the question, uh, I think our panelists have answered. So I would go to um, the questions written by uh, Mr. Kumanet. So um, the question is, how can a school principal who is overwhelmed with administrative tasks mentor the teachers effectively? So um, that is the first question. So I think uh, I think uh, well, the panelists can answer the first question and we will go to the second question later. Um, once again, the question is, how can a school principal who is overwhelmed with administrative tasks mentor the, the teachers effectively? So that is the question. Um, I, I would give the floor to um, Dr. Sosas to answer the question. Sure. So uh, the question was, how can a school principal who is overwhelmed with the administrative? So that's one uh, aspect of your job as a, a school leader is to be an administrator. We all have those administrative, but uh, being a mentor is uh, again, like we've been saying, is relational. And uh, once you, uh, by de facto, once you uh, interact with uh, teachers, and anybody involved in your school site and your school uh, environment, and you start developing that interaction, that relationship, you can find opportunities to mentor, to for provide those uh, opportunities to have a conversation, maybe uh, set a, a day of a week. You know, on Monday, I'm going to talk to John. And what would that be? It could be 10 minutes just a, an informal conversation and finding out what are the needs, what are the worries, uh, something very informal like that. But it has to be intentional, that you have the intention to create a relationship, that you wanna create a culture in your school for success. Uh, and that's a, you have to make that decision. Are you gonna be the boss uh, and just focus on the administration when you know that that other component the relational and by de facto, an opportunity to mentor is essential for your success and for the success of your school site. So uh, planning, uh, making that decision, again, it has to be intentional. And I would suggest that in order to do that, you yourself seek mentoring. Find out from somebody else that's successful. How is it that they can uh, budget their time and their schedule and how did they go about creating these uh, goals and elements of success so uh, you can't um, I don't I wouldn't suggest you just do it blindly find some other successful models and find ways to balance those roles and um, it, it's possible it's it's doable but you have to want it uh, but again Find yourself a mentor, look for other successful models, make that decision, set that goal. Thank you. May I, may I share something? Yes, please. Um, yes, okay. please. Okay. I think first, I think also that um, principals, the leaders on the campus um, also need uh, professional development on how to not only find a mentor, and grow professionally in their own way, in their own right, but also they must know how to mentor others. I know that with those skill specialists that 
we were talking about earlier, um, the skill specialists are extensions of the principal. So the, when the principal might have to be doing administrative tasks that day or that morning, perhaps the skill specialist is out there in the classroom working with the teacher, coaching the teacher on a mathematics skill or on a math uh, pro pro problem. Um, I have seen the skill specialist bring the teacher into their classroom or their office area and actually go over the lesson. What is, what is it that they're teaching and break that lesson down? Just like I shared with the tennis coach, they broke that lesson down by looking at the foot, the stance of the feet, um, the, um, the hand on the racket where it's placed, the shoulders squared, et cetera. So what I'm saying is that skill specialist has that opportunity to work with the teacher even more so sometimes than the principal in terms of mentoring. But I think principals can utilize, uh, for example, uh, utilize the mentors that are placed on the campuses there, even in, in Cambodia. I think that it's so important that our leaders uh, really learn, uh, you know, how to utilize the people that are on their campuses to assist with this mentoring role and, and coaching role. So it's so um, important uh, to transform that particular um, school uh, to, to ratchet it up, to be a better school uh, and all of the things that even, uh, I loved what our His Excellency uh, Professor Neron Minister said, um, you know, about the schools there and what, where they're going. And <clears throat> really in order to do that, um, we have to have the leaders really involved in their vision, I think as Dr. Laura said, and Dr. Thorosos and, and Dr. Christine Nanga said, you know, they have to have the vision and uh, they have to articulate that vision and they have to shepherd that vision. And part of that is working with their mentor or skills specialist or those mentor specialists on their campuses. And so um, that's what I think that has to happen for sure to really overcome some of those administrative duties. You, you utilize your extensions and your lead teachers. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abby and Dr. Sosas for your amazing answer. And um, we have two more questions and we have uh, around 10 more minutes to go. So um, allow me to read another question written by um, Mr. Kumanet. His second question is about Mentoring program is said to be helpful for teachers and it's contribute to teacher retention. However, it is likely that mentoring program can lead to teachers turn over in school. So um, the question, what, what are possible reasons behind this? So, so, so that the question, um, but once again, I will read the question for you once again. So mentoring program is said to be helpful for teachers and it contributes to teacher retention. However, it is likely that mentoring program can lead to teachers turn over in school. So the question, what were the reason, what the possible reason we have? So um, Dr. Sosas? Yes, I've witnessed that many times and it happens when the culture uh, when it, it's not in alignment with uh, the mentee, when there's a lot of, uh, it's a mismatch between the mentor and the mentee, and uh, they have different uh, cultural backgrounds and understanding of that relationship, and uh, it, it just creates that uh, dissonance, and uh, the teacher leaves because they don't feel that the school space, the environment, uh, understands or is culturally competent to understand uh, the needs of that teacher. And it, it typically happens like that when there's a mismatch, in my experience. Thank you very much. Dr. Kristen? I think uh, from a school leader's perspective, if your school is not it, something is wrong with the school culture, mentoring will not fix it. So 
if a new teacher comes and they're being mentored, retain, they, they will still not be retained because part of what they're being mentored into is a culture that doesn't work for them. So even as much as we want to retain good teachers, we have to work within the school culture that really allows these teachers to stay in terms of job satisfaction, administrative support, all those things go along with the mentoring. So in spite of the mentoring, young teachers can leave because the culture could be toxic. Yeah. And not all mentors are good. So if the principal has not chosen good mentors, they might drive out the young teachers. And also, I believe that uh, for every single interaction, there should be a clear objective communication. But in addition, it's extremely important, especially for us as educators, to reflect about our mission, about our visions. Not everything is great in school. We have problems. And it's a great opportunity to put those problems on the table as together to try to find possible solutions, not to hide the problem. That's not the way to go. And that's it. I was making memories since I came to Texas in 1991. I had the commitment to visit the schools in the large cities such as Houston. When I had the great opportunity for the first time to start getting familiar with most parents are single parents. They have to work. They don't know where to leave the kids. And I brought those issues to my colleagues. And I was not in this country. I came from another that people call underdeveloped country. But I said, something is missing here. We need to communicate in more direct way to share with different stakeholders what's going on in the schools and how we together can transform those schools in something good. But if we don't close, if we don't communicate, if we keep those problems for us, we never are able to set up good relationships. And then it, when we say, here is the mentors, here are the coaches, here are the principals, et cetera, providing the whole support to this huge, huge endeavor. So it's important to keep in mind, like I said at the beginning, to double check our philosophy, our commitment, the way that we plan to work with the new generation of kids, the multiple challenges those kids have. I'm not talking about urban areas only, no. Rural, marginal, every single area, because kids deserve the right to be better prepared for the complex um, world that we are living today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great answer, Dr. Lara. And I think um, there's one last question and we have around four minutes to go. So um, one last question from uh, Mr. Sankum San. Um, the question is, what, what is the role of the mentors in responding to the principal? Uh, this meant about like the role of the mentor toward the school principal. But what should be the roles of the mentor for the, the, the principal? So I would um, give the floor to Dr. Abe. Thank you. Um, I think that um, the mentors, uh, like a mentor teacher, like that skill specialist or a men uh, anyone who's being a mentor teacher, that is um, that is actually uh, on a campus, um, whether they are a veteran teacher who's mentoring other teachers or a new mentor, uh, designated mentor and coach on a campus. Um, there must be that mentor that mentor uh, must be a member of the leadership team. I think they must be seen as part of the leadership not evaluation, not evaluation of a teacher. That is not the purpose. And it is not the purpose of the mentor to, you know, go to the principal and say, did you know what, you know, Ms. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so is doing? 
uh, in the classroom. That is not, it, it is our role as mentors and coaches to help that teacher get better. It is the building the instructional capacity and competency of the teachers in the classroom. And that's the task of the mentor. And the task of the, of the, the relationship between the mentor teacher and the principal is very key. So the principal uh, needs to ensure that the mentor has uh, the leeway, has the latitude, has um, all of the, as Dr. Christine says, the resources uh, to work with that teacher or those teachers. And I think that that is one thing, how we can um, develop uh, with each other, this leadership team um, on, the, on the campus. I don't know if any of our other panelists would like to share. Thank you very much, Dr. Alvey. And uh, Dr. Kristen, you have anything to add more? I would just reiterate the communication loop between the principal and the mentor is very, very critical. Because as Dr. Lara has told us, the mission and the vision is what the mentor is also trying to do. The mentor is not trying to do something different from the vision and the mission that the principal has already put out. So it's so important for that communication look between the mentor and the principal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Netra, I think that we're about out of time now, yes. but I would definitely like to thank our wonderful panelists uh, for being here. Um, I know it's a little earlier in California, but it's a little late for Dr. Christine over in Washington, D.C., <laughs> <laughs> over on Eastern Time. So she is probably around midnight now or a little nice. after. So we appreciate your staying up and, and uh, thank you for being with us and thank you all. And we, again, we really appreciate the hospitality of our uh, Cambodian friends who have done this as, uh, and put this conference on. Thank you so very much. And um, thank you to um, Professor Chan Roth, um, who, who is really the, the brainchild of this entire uh, process. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Erby. Thank you very much, Dr. Sosas. Thank you, Dr. Christine, and thank you very much, Dr. Laura, for your great sharing with us about leadership and mentoring. And we pretty sure that your contribution would be, would be fruitful to the strengthen leadership and mentoring, especially for Cambodian educators. Thank you very much for your time, your great contribution, your great experience, and hope to see you again. So thank you.